So um, uh, I'm going to go through this quick, and then I'm going to run. I got to go pick up my kids. So um, if you got if you got a couple of questions, we'll just make them super quick, and and, and I'll be out of here. But I've, I've got to run. I've got to just do this. And so. Okay. Cool. So Pacific biochar. Um, I, I I started. I, I just kind of started this biochar pathway a long time ago. First company I, I started truly dedicated to biochar was Hawaii Biochar. We I'm now doing work um, in California and Oregon and Washington and also uh, in Southeast Asia and Australia now. So it's grown to become Pacific Biochar. So if you want to find out more information because I left too quick. Um, you can go to the Pacific Biochar website or send me a, a link to that or something like that. Um, so what is biochar? Um, this, is this, is a, this is really important and, and this has been evolving. And I, I've been working on this. And so I have like this three paragraph definition and I just boiled it down to the most essential, which is biochar is a term. It's, it's a term, not a material. Biochar is a term. And, and the term refers to biomass charcoal when used or found in soil. That's it. So if, if you went to the store and got a bag of charcoal and you went and used it in your barbecue, that's charcoal. And if you took that bag of charcoal and went and crushed it up and used it in your soil, at some point <laughs> along that line it became biochar. Just because it's a term. And that, that's how we use that term. So you'll hear you'll hear me relate to that. Especially like right here. So um, this isn't Iowa isn't the first place people usually think of when the term biochar comes up. But I found this really interesting, that Iowa's famously fertile soils um, are now estimated that, um, that 30 to 50 percent of the organic matter in that area is pyrogenic organic material. Biochar, for lack of better words. So, so fires race through the, the rangeland and and create ash and charcoal, and that, that adds up over time. And this, one of the scientists who did the work on this, uh, Bruno Glaser, um, some of the original work on this, I asked him, oh, naturally produced from grassland fires. He said, well, humans lived here for 10,000 years, so I'm not sure if we can call them naturally produced. Um, and one of the reasons this has been uh, not really in the front and center for so long is because typically the, the way you measure carbon or organic material in soil um, does not differentiate between pyrogenically derived, fire derived carbon and um, you know wood chip that decays because it often involves a burn or a other tests that don't really pull that out. You have to run it through a um, magnetic near resonance magnetic uh, electromagnetic something I should remember the name of, but I don't. Um, all right, so. So anyways, uh, this, this would be kind of where the biochar part fits in. And so this is, a, this is, your, standard, this is your standard view of, of, of what's in our soil. Um, and, and we just had to come up with the word biochar because it became so obvious that, wow, there's a bunch of burnt stuff in our soil too. It doesn't decay very fast. It does decay eventually, but it decays so gosh darn slow that only a little bit is needed to accumulate in soil. Um, and, and so... It, it does, and so one way to call it is pyrogenic organic matter, or we just call it biochar. Um, this this is in the Amazon. This is a terrapepta soils. This is often what a lot of people think of if they've heard of biochar when when they hear that, because these soils um, are just such a very very stark, uh, very very stark and clear picture of the value of um, charcoal in soil, because. Typically, in, in a tropical environment with 200 inches of rain, this is what your soil profile is going to look like. Organic matter is being created and it's being decomposed and washed away and, and nutrients are washing away. Um, and the heavy rain just kind of pushes everything away. Um, these soils, this is, this is actually just a few hundred feet away. These soils were made by man. These soils were made by the people that lived there. And they have lots and lots of charcoal in them. And the charcoal helped allow the minerals and the organic matter to stick. All right. So that's not just black because if they put a bunch of charcoal in it, the the amount of organic matter that's not burnt 
is much, much higher in this soil than it is in this soil. So it actually gave something for everything else to stick to. And, and this was so like mind-blowing that humans created these incredibly fertile soils that, again, it sparked this whole thing about biochar. And just to kind of show, this is they, they scraped the forest off and um, planted some corn and planted some corn. That's, that's fertility that, that lasted for 500 years after the culture died or whatever happened, you know, germs and disease and stuff like that tend to kill off most of the Amazonian tribes. So, so that soil has been basically leached for 500 years and that fertility remained. So that's, kind of, it was kind of stunning and so that kind of spawned this whole idea of biochar. And I'm taking a long time. Forgive me here. So that's what it looks like up close. That's a spoon. That's, um, that's, what, that's what I view as biochar. That's a, that's, a, that's a wonderful material that I moved on the mainland. Here's that same stuff inoculated. It's covered in mostly actinomycetes and other, other things. I send it through a biological process to, to make it more, like the biochar is like the surface of the moon when it's freshly created. So I, I culture it a little bit so that it's more readily accepted by soil and plant. You get better results that way. Um, Here's, uh, here's biochar very, 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 very up close. All right, so you can see, this picture does a good job of showing you that the, the plant, this is bamboo. The plant has vascular tissue. It carries food and water throughout its body from the soil up through the leaves, right? It's carrying things all through its body. It, it has a structure. When it's burnt, like in that first picture where you show that it was glowing, right? When, when, it, when it has gone through being a piece of wood to a glowing ember and then cooled without becoming ash, that structure is essentially frozen in time. All the carbon um, connections that were cellulose and hemicellulose and lignins, those, those bonds, that the larger bonds that created the structural elements of that plant's body get frozen in time. You can find pieces of biochar that are hundreds and hundreds of years old, and you can be able to identify the species of wood or the species of plant that, that it was created from. And, and they do this in archaeological digs, in fire pits and stuff like that. That's how they find out information about really old tribes and stuff. So, so that is really important. And all that gunky stuff around that, that's, that's bacteria. This is, a, this is a, a composting study with bacillus, and they found that biochar dramatically increase the rate of, um, of biological activity. So, so it gives you a size reference. So that's the bacillus bacteria in the, in the biochar there. And then here's a mycorrhizal, um, here's the spore. This is a glomus spore. And then here's all the hyphae. You can see the size, it's just beautiful. It's just perfect. All that, all that the fungal hyphae, that's the fuzzy stuff that you would see, like the, 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 the cottony or kind of thread looking stuff. It's just, it's just plugging right into the biocharts. I feel like this picture is important. Um, so then here's stepping back a little bit more. This is in a compost pile in my yard. This is a piece of charcoal I pulled out of the ground. I, I had to literally pull this out. This was a piece of charcoal that was um, in, a in a composting experiment I was doing, so it was loaded with nutrients. And, and then I went a year or two later and pulled it out from underneath the long gone tree. And you can see here that it's just, it's covered in roots. And, and there's roots going in and out and in and, and out. So you can actually see a root coming out of the biochar. Again, showing that this is from a living, this is from living tissue that has tubes and tunnels. So with biochar, it's not like a, like a, like a chunk of gravel where the, the surface area is determined by the exterior surface. It has an interior surface, an entire, you know, for, for, for something this large, I mean, that's like a planet. If you were a, you know, if you were a, if you were a bacteria, the size of that, you could have, you could probably have a billion bacteria living on that thing. Probably more. Even. Um, so, so again, showing, showing how this material might be very interesting when thinking about soil biology. Um, so this, this is a study from the Amazon basin that I think really, um, kind of captures, again, why in Korean natural farming they, they were suggesting using charcoal. And, and why in, in a lot of Korean natural farming recipes and the, the making of IMO and, and plant propagation and, and soil treatments that talk about charcoal in, in this system that's very biologically intensive. Um, this, this is really big. So here they did a study, bacterial community composition. 
right? So how much and the composition of. Uh, in Brazilian anthrazoles, anthrazole is basically a human-made soil. That's referring to the terra preta soils. Um, and the adjacent soils, meaning the soils right next to them. Using uh, culturing and molecular identification. So here it is. Here's the community in the anthrazole with a bunch of charcoal. And here's the community without. I think that really just kind of captures it there. That's, that's kind of like healthy, healthier. That's the healthier soil. Just, just looking at the microbial diversity on that uh, and abundance. Well, I, I guess this isn't as an abundance, this is diversity. Um, again, so I said look, that bag of charcoal, you can you know, go buy a bag of charcoal and then you put your soil all of a sudden it's biochar. Um, typically, when you are creating charcoal, you're selling it for its um, weight and its thermal value, and you'll typically be in this zone. Whereas biochar production, um, you're, selling, you're, you're trying to get a product that has very high absorption, and you're oftentimes gaining that energy. So you're typically going to be in this zone. It's just it's kind of kind of important that barbecue charcoal can work, but it's not necessarily ideal. Um, so I've probably got how, how am I doing on time? All right, I'll make it really quick. The next few slides, I'm going to go through some of the aspects of biochar and some of the research articles that have been published. There's now about 3,500, 3,500 um, peer-reviewed published research articles um, regarding biochar. Not only biochar by name, often it's, if they're using the name charcoal or pyrogenic organic matter, but basically there's about 5,000, I'm sorry, 3,500 um, research articles. So, so I just, these are some of my favorites. All right, so here we go, biochar and water. Biochar application increased growth, drought tolerance, and leaf nitrogen, and water use efficiency of quinoa despite larger plant leaf areas. So they were bigger, and even though they were bigger, they still used water better. It, instead of being bigger and just sucking, you know, and just running out because they're too big. Um, and then this is a really recent one from Italy. They did a, a four years field trial in a, in a, in a very well-respected vineyard in Italy. And they found uh, as much as 66% increase in the yield without, without negatively affecting the quality of the grapes. What was really interesting is that over the four years, the greatest difference in yield was, was inversely correlated to weather. Meaning the worse the weather was, the better, the, the, the greater difference in yield. So on the dry year, basically, the biochar test plot was really pronounced above, above the other. Um, biochar and nutrient management. Um, basically, biochar helps. Okay, I've got the two minute flag here. Biochar helps hold nutrients in the soil. It holds nutrients against leaching and, and, and reduces volatilization as well. It's extremely high surface area. In the, in, in, my, in the palm of my hand, a gram of biochar, what could fit in the palm of my hand, if you were to fold that out to be two dimensional, completely two dimensional, one plane, it has the surface area of this entire room. Wow. Uh, if it's a good biochar, it has a surface area of a basketball court. In the grab your hand, in the palm of your hand, unfold it completely flat, and you, you cover a basketball court. So extremely high surface area, and a, and a surface that um, that is adsorptive, meaning that uh, ions of positive and negative charges and minerals and, and, and stuff in your soil can bond the surface. And this becomes more pronounced as humic acids and fulvic acids bond with that surface as well. It becomes extensions of that. Um, so what we find is uh, biochar treatments consistently decreased nitrous oxide emissions, which is 300 times more potent than carbon dioxide, consistently decreased nitrous oxide emissions by 14 to 37 to 73 percent from the alpha sol, um, and vertizol is two different soils there. And by 23 to 52 percent from the vertizol. Uh, the leaching of ammonia, so this is going down, the leaching of ammonium was reduced by 55 to 93 percent. So they, le they lost less nitrogen. Really kind of important. Um, and uh, da -da 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 -da. This, is, this is another one that was just done recently. This one, they, they mixed the biochar with the fertilizer and found great results. They mixed the biochar with the compost and found great results. Rather than spreading the biochar throughout your entire field to increase your net capture, you know, like basically creating a better filter, they just put it right in the fertilizer and right in the compost. 
and, and basically we're able to achieve somewhat of a similar thing, which is, a, which is more economic approach. Um, locally, I sell a fertilizer that's taking, uh, it's a fish meat and bone meal from Oahu, blended with biochar and some other minerals, and that's used over on Kona side, um, mostly in coffee farms, and those guys love it. Um, for that same reason, we, we, we're, we're losing less nitrogen. Um, here they use biochar in a poultry litter. All right, so using it in, in a high nitrogen composting situation. And in that, they reduced the ammonia, the ammonia concentrations in the emissions were lower by up to 64%. So they reduced ammonia emissions in the poultry litter by 64%. Um, and then the total loss of nitrogen was reduced by 52%, where the biochar was used in the compost, in the, in the high nitrogen poultry litter compost. Um, okay, biochar with microbes and fungi, um, and I've kind of gone over that a bit already. Um, lots of great results and some scientific studies. Um, biochar and soil contaminants, specifically for Hawaii, this is very important. We have a toxic legacy left over from um, decades of, uh, of um, not knowing uh, and, and putting lots of bad chemicals in the soil. And so there's arsenic and, and, and a lot more stuff than that. <laughs> so, Biochar can help that. And, and basically, this is how it works. I'm going to I'll break it down in the first two sentences here. Biochar is an indiscriminate bank. It has an extremely high surface area, and it doesn't care who you are. You can, you can come, I'm right here, I want it. It's an indiscriminate bank for, 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 for ions and both charges. But the biology in the soil is discriminate. Plants and soil microbes do choose. I mean, I don't think they sit there and decide. You know, I was kind of thinking, but they have, you know, for whatever, in, in whatever mechanisms, they're able to selectively. So what we find is that where biochar is put in the soil, it's not as though the arsenic is poof, gone, but the arsenic that was in the soil is no longer showing up. I guess arsenic's not a good idea, because I, I don't, because it, it kind of stays in there. But So I'm working on a project in California. California has cadmium high level of cadmium in a, lot of their, in a lot of really good soil areas. So right now I'm working with, uh, um, with extension agents there, we're doing test plots and reducing the cadmium. And there's a bunch of research that always shows effectiveness, and we're just looking at my products and the price points and if we can make it all work. And what we're finding is that you put the biochar in the soil, you don't reduce the cadmium in the soil, but you reduce the plant uptake of cadmium. All right, same with all kinds of hydrocarbons and and organic compounds like pesticides and herbicides and, and, and certain heavy metals. Um, that's kind of, that's shown well in this. They, they did a fungal, they, they did a soft rock phosphate, right? So a lot of people in organic farming use um, rock phosphate. Rock phosphate has a lot of fluorine in it, um, which is kind of problematic. Um, you know, when, when, the, when, the, when, the, when the phosphorus is feed off, there's this extra fluorine cruising around. And sometimes that reduces the plant's ability to cleave off phosphorus and just... So anyways, they tried mixing stuff with this rock phosphate, and what they found is that when biochar was mixed with the rock phosphate, it, it, gave some, it gave somewhere for the fluorine to stick to. Not, first of all, it, the, the mycorrhizae or the, the, the fungi were able to have a better... They had greater activity in cleaving the, the phosphorus and the fluorine, and once they did, the fluorine had something to stick to and was no longer causing such a problem, and the plants were able to take the phosphorus and, and go over it. So I think that's kind of a great example of biochar, uh, this, this great surface area bank, kind of like other organic matters as well, being able to help um, make a, to, to help kind of buffer the situation when you have nutrient dysfunction in soils. And I probably ran out of time here, so here it is. I broke it down to three things to remember because I probably just shoved way too much at you. So one, biochar is a long-lived organic matter. When I say long-lived, I mean hundreds to thousands of years. Um, wood chips last a few years, biochar lasts hundreds to thousands. It is incredibly porous, which makes good housing for microorganisms. Nutrients and water bind to its surface in a way that they can be selectively pulled off by plants and microbes. That's about it. I see a question. Is there a particular plant that you uh, partnered with, like you're in this on removing a particular uh, uh, mineral or, 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 or whatever is in the dirt? Is 
Oh, the cadmium problem? Yeah, well, the problem the is, is these soils that have cadmium are great soils for growing lettuce, and lettuce is a great, uh, it, 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 it's a bioaccumulator of cadmium, so it's kind of a problem. But locally here, um, something that's, that's really good news is that there's been no production since I stopped. There's been no production of biochar since I stopped. No, no commercial production of biochar since I stopped. And as of like this week, I've got five cubic yards of biochar available every single day at half the price that I was able to sell before. So, so we're going to revitalize the soils, but I'm going to get to my main question. And you're looking to try to like replenish the dirt. Is there a particular plant that you developed to remove certain things and then, you know, not contest it again? Or is well, it okay? I mean, there's, there's, the soils that are messed up are just kind of messed up. Um, but biochar can help kind of at least make it less of a problem. But my, my big dream for Pahamukula is like, we have very similar situations to the terra cut soils. We have tons and tons and tons of rain. Um, you saw, like, you know, add some charcoal and things work to work really good. We find a lot of it. So I'm imagining, like, yeah, let's, let's, let's do it. Natural farming, biochar, let's become a cool awesome again. Yeah. Thanks, guys.